These are serious days. I have been in the ministry now since 1972, so it's 46 years and counting. I do not recall when I have ever lived through a time where there is so much that is going wrong and so much that is unexplainable, and yet at the same time the proliferation of information so that people are reading so many things from morning till night, and the struggle with all of that is they don't know what they're reading, if it is true or false. Once upon a time, you had to earn the right to be heard. People had to know something about you. They had to know your credentials, your track record, what your life has been like, and all of that. Today, anybody can get in front of a computer and type out whatever they wish. They don't have to defend it. They don't even have to give us their name. And yet, we read and read and read and we find out how confused our world has become. But the tragedy is that the more we have access to, and the more that we are living with in an abundance of supplies, have you ever realized how empty we have become at the same time? Just this morning, a celebrity chef, we were informed, at the age of 61, took his life. Anthony Bourdain. A few days ago, Kate Spade, the well-known designer, took her life. I think both were by hanging. The, the interior, the, the, the fashion designer had, has an 11-year-old daughter that she has left behind. Anthony Bourdain has left a 13-year-old daughter behind. And the fascinating thing is the one-liners that come out of their lives now. The designer left a note for her daughter in one line. I have always loved you. This has nothing to do with you. Ask your father. So what does an 11-year-old do if it had nothing to do with her? And now she is going to ask her father. And you wonder, will she get the truth? And the celebrity chef made a comment of his rather unguarded lifestyle, and he made a comment, and he said, I have never seen my body as a temple. I have seen it as a fun house. Well, the fun evidently had run out, and the house is now empty. Two very creative individuals, one in the world of culinary arts, another in fashion design, choose to end their lives. She was 55, he 61. So relatively in the peak of their accomplishment and their successes. Why does this happen? In some ways, I can relate. I was 17 years old in Delhi when I had tried to take my own life. And God protected me from my own schemes and designs and sent me the scriptures to remind me that my body was not a fun house, that my body actually didn't even belong to me. It belonged to him, and it was the temple of the living God. Why does this happen? Why at the peak of success does a man who commands wide audiences wherever he goes, there's a picture of him somewhere on YouTube now, hosting President Obama and them having a bite together somewhere, I don't know if it was France or where it was. My colleague who's here with me, one of my traveling colleagues, signed, said to me, Ravi, if you had a dream life, wouldn't it be something like what he had, going all over the world, tasting all of the culinary delicacies, having an audience, wealth, success, fame, pleasure, all that you wanted, and yet he snuffs his life out. Why does this happen? Ladies and gentlemen, it is vitally important that you and I have the most fundamental questions in life answered. And the most fundamental question is this, what does it mean to be human? 
What does it mean to be human? So many different answers are given to us. So many different answers. And the gospel is the only message I know which coherently answers all of the deepest questions of the heart and soul, but not just coherently, but specifically to particular questions gives us the truth. I am the way, the truth, and the life, said our Lord. And if you take that triad in an answer, the way, the truth, and the life, you begin to see how critical it was that he stated it that way. But we are living in a time where truth has died. You see, if you go back to the 13 and the 1400s, rationalism had held sway. Man was deemed to be a thinking being. Then on the heels of rationalism, with all kinds of questions being asked of rationalists, empiricism came into being in the 17 and 1800s. Man became an empirical being, from a thinking being or a rational being to an empirical being and a laboratory testing individual. But on the heels of that also came the likes of an Immanuel Kant, and man actually ended up becoming a skeptical being. Metaphysical propositions could not be trusted anymore. You could not trust moral statements or judgments about issues of meaning and the purpose of life. We were purely empirical beings. We could only talk about that which could be tested in the laboratory. From thinking and rational beings to empirical beings or skeptical beings. Then came the existentialists and the nihilists. The nihilists sort of despairing to find meaning. And the existentialists come up with the response that you have to will to find meaning. Slap against the door of despair. Push it away. Somehow pull yourself out up by your existential bootstraps and define what meaning is really all about. And we became existential beings, giving a lot of vent to our emotions from thinking and rational beings, to skeptical beings, to emotional beings. And then postmodernism came along and basically told you, you define your own, own self kind of being. And what did we lose? In postmodernity, we came to the conclusion that there was no such thing as truth, no such thing as meaning, and no such thing as certainty. No truth, no meaning, no certainty. The three very real issues with which we need to define life. What is true? What does my life mean? How can I be certain of the answers that I am clinging to? And it is fascinating that just as postmodernism has taken over, we are facing now a society and a reality where the youngest amongst us are the loneliest of us all. My colleague my, who works here in Seattle held a youth conference some time ago. He actually happens to also be my nephew. We were with him last evening. And Nathan said to me, he said, Uncle, I think the most turning point in that whole conference was when a young lad, I forget whether he was 12 or 14, walked up to the microphone and a panel of speakers was sitting on, there, on the platform there. And he looked at them and he said this, I just have one question and I want you all to be very honest and tell me what the answer is, because I'm not playing with this answer. I want this answer to be right. I have struggled with taking my life a few times. Can you please tell me what my life actually means? So young lad, I want to know what it means, because I've struggled with taking my own life. In other words, our questions merit truthful answers, and the entailments become obvious with the answer that you cling to. You know, Winston Churchill, years ago, made the comment. He said, truth is the most valuable thing in the world. It's the most valuable thing in the world. In fact, it is so valuable that often it is protected by a bodyguard of lies. He was talking about intelligence in warfare. Truth is the most valuable thing, so valuable that often it is protected by a bodyguard of lies. Natan Sharansky, Israel's former justice minister, went back to the Soviet Union where he'd been incarcerated in solitary confinement for years. 
And when he went back, he went to visit the prison where they'd kept him. His wife was with him. And as they were about to enter the, those dark confines, he put his arm out and stopped his wife and said to her, can I go in for a moment alone, please? Because this is where I found myself when I was all alone and no input from anywhere else except what I had inside me in this darkness. She honored that request. He went in, spent several minutes in there, came out, a battery of microphones in front wanting to interview him. And he said, can you wait for this interview, please? I want to the grave, want to go to the grave of this physicist, Andrei Sakharov, who gave to the Soviets the atomic bomb. I want to go and honor his memory. And he went and laid the wreath at Sakharov's grave. And he said this, the reason I wanted to honor this man is because what he said in the closing days of his life, I always thought that the most powerful weapon in the world was the bomb. I always thought that the most powerful weapon in the world was the bomb. I have changed my mind. The most powerful weapon in the world is not the bomb. The most powerful weapon in the world is the truth. It's the most valuable thing. It's the most powerful thing. And yet, with our postmodern mindset, there is no such thing as absolute truth anymore. This is so ironic, so ironic. Please hear me carefully. In all that we are seeing with the moral confusion of our time and the so-called Me Too movement and all of that, what you see happening is the quintessential expression of the contradiction with which we live. All of our university students are taught, primarily at least they're taught, that truth is not absolute. Morality is not absolute. They are trained to be relativistic in their thinking. They are trained to be relativists. And so when they go out in their professions and live relativistic lifestyles, all of a sudden they are smacked with an absolute. You don't do these things. Why not? Why not? If relativism holds sway, what am I told? It's ultimately relative to myself. Or if you wish, when the absolutes were gone, we had to park it somewhere, and of all places, we parked it in the institution that we trust the least. We call it being politically correct. The one institution that we doubt. And that's where we parked our absolutes at the same time. You see, every one of us has absolutes. The only difference is whether we abide by them or only use them by which to judge somebody else. The absolute is inescapable in your heart. The question is, do you live by it or do you only use it to judge other lives? I want to take this notion of truth now as an absolute, and I want to give you two comments, and you'll have to listen to them very carefully because I'm moving you along a trajectory of one of these two comments, and I'll tell you why I'm doing that. One comes, both of them come from Malcolm Muggeridge. My great, uh, uh, I, I loved Muggeridge because of the way he knew how to use language. In fact, Muggeridge said when he stood before God, he would have to ask for forgiveness for being so fatally fluent. <laughs> he knew how to turn a phrase. But here's what he said in his, uh, in his autobiography, A Green Stick, the, chronicle of, uh, the Green Stick, A Chronicle of Wasted Years. Here's what he says, truth is very beautiful. More so, I consider, than justice, which is today's pursuit, and easily puts on a false face. In the nearly seven decades I have lived through, the world has overflowed with bloodshed and explosions, whose dust has never had time to settle before others have erupted, all in purportedly just causes. The quest for justice continues and the weapons of hatred pile up, but truth was an early casualty. The lies on behalf of which our wars have been fought and our peace treaties concluded. The lies of revolution and counter-revolution. The lies of advertising of news of salesmanship 
leadership of politics, the lies of the priest in his pulpit, the professor at his podium, the journalist at his typewriter, the lies stuck like a fishbone in the throat of the microphone, the handheld lies of the prowling cameraman. Ignatius alone told me once when he was a member of the old common turn, some stratagem was under discussion, and a delegate, a newcomer who had never attended before, made the extraordinary observation that if such and such a statement were to be made, it ought not to be made because it wouldn't be true. There was a moment of dazed, stunned silence. Then everyone began to laugh. They laughed and laughed until tears ran down their cheeks and the Kremlin walls seemed to shake. The same laughter echoes in every council chamber and cabinet room, wherever two or more are gathered to exercise authority. It is truth that has died, not God. What Muggeridge is talking about here is propositional truth, whether an answer as it is given conforms to reality as it is. He's talking about propositional truth. We use this in a courtroom. Were you at such and such a place when this event actually happened? They are looking for a corroborating answer that is an actuality in keeping with what happened. But then Muggeridge is able to take that slender thread of truth and slice it up in two with this perception here, and this is what I really want to zero on, but you're gonna to have to listen carefully what he says. In this sargasso sea of fantasy and fraud, how can I or anyone else hope to swim unencumbered? How can I learn to see through and not with the eye? How do I take off my own motley and wash, up, wash away my, wake up, my own makeup? How do I raise the iron shutter, put out the studio lights, silence the sound effects, and put the cameras to sleep? Will I ever watch the sunrise on Sunset Boulevard and set over Forest Lawn? Can I find furniture among the studio props, silence in a discotheque, love in a striptease, read truth of an auto cue, catch it on a screen or chase it on the wings of Muzak, view it in living color with the news, hear it in living sound along the motorways. No, not in the wind that rent the mountains and broke in pieces the rocks, not in the earthquake that followed, nor in the fire that followed the earthquake, but in a still small voice, not in the screeching of tires either, or in the grinding of brakes, nor in the roar of jets, or the whistle of sirens, or the howl of trombones, the rattle of drums, or the chanting of demo voices. Again and again, it comes back to me, that still small voice, if one could only catch it. He goes on to say, it's the voice of God. Can I find furniture in a studio prop? Can I chase it on the wings of Muzak? Where do I find what's real? That's the area of truth that I really want to address because that's where I think we have picked our own pockets and lost the reality of what has happened to us. We do not know which way to turn to anymore. You see, what has happened at the end of all of our experimentation is basically this. Philosophy has become existential. Art has become sensual. Education has become skeptical. Religion has become mystical. Our culture has become trivial. And Christianity is made minimal. They drive us into a minimalistic worldview from the existential side of philosophy to the sensual side of the arts, to the skeptical side of education, mystical side of religion, and the trivial side of existence, we have now come to minimalistic beliefs, and we wonder what has happened to us as a society. I want to give you the roadmap to how we got here, and I will race through this and share this with you. These are not really my categories. In the 1970s and 80s, social thing theorists were talking about this and giving us all these definitions that were so relevant to our time, and I have borrowed it from many great social thinkers. There were three moods that took place. The first was the mood of secularization. 
and they defined it for us in these terms. Secularization is the process by which religious ideas, institutions, and interpretations have lost their social significance. Secularization is the process by which religious ideas, institutions, and interpretations have lost their social significance. It is important to know that it is a process. It works itself through culture, and in that culture, its value diminishes anything transcendent, anything that you believe of an eternal perspective or a transcendent perspective. You cannot invoke the notion of God in arguing for a sense of morality. And yet, when you think of those who've warned us what exactly has happened over the centuries? Was it not uh, Solzhenitsyn who told us that the West is on the verge of collapse and how much damage has been done by the reality of this notion that we no longer need to believe in God? Solzhenitsyn said when he was a little boy, in the dimly lit room of his home, he would be running around and playing and he'd hear his grandfather leaning over a table talking to the family. He said, I knew the evening would be coming to an end when his grandfather would say to everyone around, do you know why all this is happening to us here in Russia? Do you know why all this slaughter? Do you know why all this killing? Do you know why the gulag and all of this? Because of one reality, we have forgotten God. We have forgotten God. And so his thousands of pages that he wrote and the tens of thousands that he read reminded people in the West that we are on the verge of collapse instituted by our own hands and our own thinking when we forget God. So religious ideas and institutions have lost their social significance. Just imagine in any university, if you believe in the sanctity of marriage or you believe in the sacredness of what the body is all about, you are looked as some kind of strange specimen that has walked into an educational institution. This is the horror of our time. But you know, C.S. Lewis wonderfully illustrates the tragedy of what it is that happens when you lose that source of defining right and wrong. You know, many years ago, a famous uh, pornographer was on trial in Atlanta, Georgia. His magazines were supposed to be so perverse that they even made Playboy magazine look pretty ordinary. But this man had one of the finest lawyers defending him, and the lawyer was very clever. He would build an argument something like this. Those who were testifying against his client, he would say something like this to them. Do you ever go into a, have you ever gone into an art gallery? Yes. Have you ever gone into an art gallery where there are paintings by the great masters of art? Yes. Have you ever paid to go into an art gallery where there are paintings of the great masters of art, where there are disrobed people or new paintings of the, uh, somebody in the nude? Have you ever paid to go into an art gallery like that? And then say, somebody would say, yeah, I, I have gone into an art gallery like that. Will you please tell this jury why you call that art and why you call my client stuff pornography? You know, a very logical question would be, how many marriages do you know have broken up because the husband went too often into a museum of art? <laughs> we don't have common sense anymore, do we? But C.S. Lewis puts his finger on the nerve here. It's so brilliant. And in his Abolition of Man, he does the same thing. But Pilgrim's Regress is a brilliant book. It's an allegory of a man in search of meaning and answers. And when you read it, you find how brilliant Lewis's mind was. So he talks about this young man by the name of John, who's going from philosophy to philosophy and ends up with a mountain called the spirit of the age. But fascinatingly, Lewis describes him not as free in living for the spirit of the age, but his hands are bound in chains living for the spirit of the age. And the mountain, who can, the man who controls the spirit of the age is with that neuronic stare looking down upon him. And all of a sudden, he is given his breakfast, and his hands are unbound to enjoy that breakfast. And as he takes a sip of milk, 
and says how delicious and nourishing it is. The waiter who brings it to him, representing the spirit of the age, says to him, ah, you only call it delicious and nourishing. All it is is the secretion of a cow, isn't it? The cow secretes urine. The cow secretes milk. You call it delicious and nourishing. It's just a secretion of a cow, isn't it? And then John doesn't know where to go from there, and he made a big blunder. He commented on the tastiness of the eggs. <laughs> and now you should have seen what the waiter compared the eggs to. And he had no way to respond. But as he's put back in chains, reason comes riding on a horse to lift him up and rescue him. And reason looks at he who runs the spirit of the age and says to him, Sir, you lie. You lie. Because you don't know the difference between what nature is meant for nourishment and what nature is meant for garbage. You don't know the difference between what nature is meant for nourishment and what nature has meant for garbage. That distinction is lost today. We have no understanding of what is true, good, and beautiful, what is evil, heinous, and destructive. We consider all choices equally valid because we no longer know the difference between what nature is meant for nourishment and what nature is meant for garbage. So you see this pornographer, when he's peddling his stuff, to destroy lives, to destroy men, to make them so hooked onto this that no one human being can ever satisfy that mind anymore because he's taken away the value of a human being and replaced it with the pursuit of a feeling. That's all they've done and nobody can fulfill that. When a woman or a man sits in front of the lens of a camera purely to titillate the basic instincts and imagination of a person, to do that and provoke them to the erotic and the sensual and the self-gratifying immediately. They ought to put their arms in front of themselves and say to the cameraman or the publisher, don't do this to me. Don't do this to me. You are reducing me to something so base. But the person who doesn't say that and continues with the process will continue with the process because they have lost their sense of shame. And when secularization has done its bidding in your heart and mine, it will all be because it will destroy a legitimate sense of shame, which is a God-given reminder to us of that which is wrong. Just a few days ago, my colleagues and I were hosting somebody who's in the media world. That's all I'll say to you. And a marriage has fallen apart. What does it have to do with anything? It has to do with the husband's addiction to pornography, that she no longer can trust him when this is what he does to feed his mind and his brain again and again. Jim Dobson says when he saw, talked to Ted Bundy, shortly before his execution, that mass murderer and cannibalist. He looked at Dr. Dobson and said, this all began for me with pornography. He said, Dr. Dobson, tell the young never to get into this. It builds an insatiable hunger that nobody can ever satisfy and nobody can ever fulfill. That is only one illustration of what has happened in our society where the quotient of shame has been removed. Secularization, seculum literally means this worldly. You live for the moment and when you desacralize the body and you see your body as a fun house, you end up wanting to destroy it and say, I cannot face life any more. Ladies and gentlemen, when God sends conviction to you for something that is wrong, it's to guard you and protect you from going further down the line into things that are more decimating and things that are more destructive. So many homes have been victimized today by the mass media and the seduction of the conscience. Secularization. 
but we move from that to pluralization. Pluralization is where there's a competing number of ideas in our worldview, and no one worldview is dominant. A competing number of ideas in our worldview, and no worldview is dominant. Again, social theorists have given us this definition. A competing number of worldviews, but no worldview is dominant. You know, uh, culinary-wise, I'm glad for pluralism. When I arrived in Toronto while I was 20 years old, there was only one Indian restaurant, which was an embarrassment to Indians. <laughs> Awful. They didn't know how to make a curry. I just looked at that and I said, boy, if nobody ever likes this food, I can't blame them. But today you go to Toronto. When I got to Toronto in 1966, there were 500 Indians in Toronto. 500 Indians. So that if you saw an Indian across the street, you'd go over and start talking until you find out he's generally trying to sell you something, and then, then you moved on. <laughs> Today, if you stop at the airport in, uh, in Toronto, Pearson Airport, and you just say, Mr. Singh, about 500 will turn around and think you're calling them. Because today in Toronto, there are 500,000 Indians. There were only 500 then in the mid-60s. You can go to Los Angeles, and as one uh, soci sociologist said, you can see a Korean in a fast food outlet selling kosher tacos. <laughs> That's pluralization. That's pluralization of cuisine. So many, you know, our, our team of apologists, we have 70 plus of them. I love their accents. I love how they represent their country. I love the thing. Pluralization is a great idea. Pluralization is a great idea. But pluralization not properly understood can lead to relativism when there's no dominant worldview undergirding our culture. What is the worldview that's undergirding America now? Nobody knows. Nobody knows what the worldview is. And when you have this kind of a pluralized, pluralized mentality, you end up with systemic contradiction again and again and again. And you say to yourself, why is life falling apart? Why don't I ever get a proper answer? And so the songwriter says, cat's foot, iron claw, neurosurgeon, scream for more from paranoia's poison door, 21st century schizoid man. Blood rack, barbed wire, politicians, funeral pyre, innocence rate with napalm fire, 21st century schizoid man. Death seed, blind man's greed, poet starving, children bleed, nothing he's got he really needs. 21st century schizoid man. Now notice this, the walls on which the prophets wrote is cracking at the seams. Upon the instruments of death, the sunlight brightly gleams. Will no one lay the laurel wreath as silence drowns the screams? Between the iron gates of fate, the seeds of time are sown, and watered by the deeds of those who know and who are known. Knowledge is a deadly friend when no one sets the rules. The fate of all mankind, I see, is in the hands of fools. Confusion will be my epitaph as I crawl a cracked and broken path. If we make it, we can all sit back and laugh, but I'm afraid tomorrow I'll be crying. This brokenness, this emptiness, this sense of desolation and aloneness is what is now systemic in our culture because we are living with systemic contradiction. With systemic contradiction. Ladies and gentlemen, when God gave us the first commandment, it was only one. Only one. Don't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Because the day you do, you will surely die. And the enemy of our souls came and what did he say? Not true, not true. But he did tell us the truth then. He said, you will be as God, knowing good and evil. Do you know what he was placing as a temptation? Play God. Play God. Be the definer of good and evil. Today, for our healthcare laws, we need 20,000 pages. Before there was just one. As Norman Geisler, my professor, used to say, the problem was not the apple in the tree, it was the pear on the ground. 
very real. They became the definer of good and evil. The moment you do that, you die the death of a thousand qualifications with every moral stipulation. So you get onto a plane, and what do they tell you? Do not touch, tamper, disable, or destroy. Why all those words? The smoke detector. Don't touch, tamper, disable, or destroy. Why don't you just say, don't mess with that thing? <laughs> you know why? Because every one of those words can die the death of a thousand qualifications in a courtroom. Because we can play God. It's fascinating today what has happened to the courts of law where so much goes on in language and you never know who's telling you the truth and what the truth is all about. Secularization leads to no shame. Pluralization ends up bereft of reason, which brings you to the closing one, which is privatization, where there's a cleavage in the modern experience between your public and your private life. And in that cleavage, you are forced to find meaning in your private life. You know, India is facing some very, very challenging days. One of the members of the Congress party has gone on a YouTube saying, India is planning to redefine, it's going to rewrite its constitution. They say the constitution was defined to contain within that geographical boundary but there are extremists on one side that says we ought not to be defined by a geographical boundary. We ought to be defined by our religious inclination and who we are here predominantly. And so philosophically, they plan to rewrite the Constitution. So says at least one member of parliament out there. We may not be rewriting our Constitution here, but we in effect are doing the same thing by not honoring the intent of what it was all about to start with. We are controlling the way thinking goes on. And what we are told now is, you can believe whatever you want to believe, but believe it in private. Don't bring it out into public. The moment you bring it out into public, you're violating the public space, and you are now infringing upon the rights of somebody else. So here we are, 2018. We do not know how to define anything. We cannot define who we are in gender. We cannot define who we are in marriage. We cannot define who we are in our proclivities. We cannot define anything of any worth or of any absolute. We toss it up into the wind, as it were, and decide which way we are wanting to go. This is a dangerous time in which to be alive because there are no definitions. When you don't have any definitions, how are we going to deal with reality? You know, I have, uh, Winston Churchill was once told by a corporal, Mr. Churchill, have I ever told you about my grandchildren? And Churchill said, no, and I want you to know how much I appreciate it. <laughs> well, I have five grandchildren, and since I'm not Churchill, I will violate it. I have a little grandson who is about, about to turn seven later on uh, this year. He has an amazing vocabulary, an amazing vocabulary. I don't know where he comes up with the words. Uh, so when he was about five or something like that, he looked at me one day across the dining table and said, Papa, what is the meaning of sophomoric? <laughs> and I sounded sophomoric trying to define it for him. Recently, he'd learned about the whole issue of slavery and so on, and it really crushed his heart. This guy with a little tender heart, he came back to his mother and he said, how could this happen? How can this happen? How did people get hurt so badly? How do they justify this? How do we justify this? And then he paused. It's a little kid. He looked at his mother and said, you know, I have a friend. He comes from another country. Do you think one day people may treat him badly too because he comes from somewhere else? And Naomi, my daughter, said, why do you ask that? 
Here's what he begins his answer by saying. He said, Mommy, my hypothesis... <laughs> my hypothesis is this. If you want to hate somebody, you will find a reason to hate them. If you want to hate somebody, you will find a reason to hate them. This is the same little guy when he was three and a half who looked at his mother when she'd lost her car keys and couldn't find it. Naomi, my daughter, she slapped her forehead and said, I must be losing my mind. <laughs> and he looked at her and said, Mommy, whatever you do, please don't ever lose your heart because I'm in there. <laughs> he has learned from a young age what it means to be in the heart of somebody. What it means to be in the heart of somebody and what it means to be loved in a home where you're valued and where you care. Let me ask you this. Do you know anybody in your life who doesn't have that feeling? Who feels there is no home for their heart? There are scores of people in our world devoid of that relationship who are living desolate, desperate, lonely lives without meaning, without purpose. I sometimes think about the cross and shut my eyes and try to see the cruel nails, the crown of thorns, and Jesus crucified for me. But even could I see him die, I would but see a little part of that great love which, like a fire, is always burning in his heart. The love of God for you, for me. When a man can leave a little girl and choke himself to death, he obviously didn't understand that God really loved him. God loves his little girl. When a woman can say, I love you, this has nothing to do with you, but ends up leaving that little girl for the rest of her life, trying to figure out what happened to my mom. I was in Iraq last year with both of my colleagues here. The last day we were taken out for lunch by a man who was a killer. He was avenging any killing done by ISIS and all that kind of stuff. And one day he was avenging the death of his, the killing of his brother. And he walked into the room of the man at night and at point blank range, pulled the gun, the trigger against the temple of the man and killed him. Unknown to him, the four-year-old son of the boy man was lying next to him. And this blood comes spurting out and gushing out. And the little boy sits up and he says, Where's my father? And he was so stunned, he looked at him and he said, uh, He's gone to paradise. He says, Take me to him. He reached out and held the hand of the killer. Take me to my father, I want to be with my dad. This fellow goes out into the night and he sits in a garbage heap, which he said, which is where I belonged with what I'd done to myself. And as he's struggling to hold back the tears coming out like a fountain, sobbing his heart out as to what he'd done to himself. But he said, I struggled to sleep, but every time I slept, in a few minutes, I would see Jesus in my dream again and again and again. I was getting angry till finally I surrendered and gave my life to Jesus Christ. He is working now in a ministry, a hospital, which binds the wounds of the broken, including the enemy. And he drives people back and forth. He was driving us. When he told the story, I kept looking at him and I said, who was he before? Who is he now? The difference is what Christ had done in his heart 
and turned him from being a killer into a being a healer of people. Ladies and gentlemen, when privatization has done its work, it strangles the sacred and strangles meaning from your life. Secularization, no shame. Pluralization, no reason. Privatization, no sacred, no reality of the holy and no meaning. Tomorrow when I speak to you, I want to give you the answers. Of how then does the Christian worldview respond to secularization, pluralization, and privatization and see the beautiful answers of the gospel in all of this? May God richly bless you. Thank you for giving me a hearing.